Hello, this is going to be a redo of an old video I did on creating animated USB assets and time, time offsetting. So one of the effects we're going to create is going to be sort of a time offset flower growth of the vine, like so. And the reason I'm redoing this video is because this user pointed out on the last video that uh, the way I was previously writing out animated assets was inefficient and correct. So they uh kindly sent over some files that I could look at the proper way to do it and I was able to build a better understanding as well as looking at the documentation. So hopefully I can pass that on here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just drop down a soft create and we're gonna start by creating our USD asset. So I'm just gonna paste in a geometry that I've already got. This is just a static right here. And I've got a balance in for the animation. So you notice this is static though. We're not worrying about the animation right now. I'm gonna set my path B slash crash grass <clears throat> grass geo so basically um redoing the or we're recreating the component builder here after this i'm just going to drop in a reference and i want to reference in a material library like so in here i'm going to add a standard surface and set this to just green okay i'm going to set my path here to also be slash grass slash Material slash auto build materials, and then now I can set this to slash grass. Although we're in our file, we want to be in the multi input, like so. Then I can just assign the material down here. And if you're not seeing the material, you want to make sure you have the material flag turned on. Like so, we're doing an error that we need to specify the save path. So I'm going to drop down a configure layer like this. Set my save path be this will be my geo.usdc and we're using usdc because that's the binary so it takes the least disk space and we don't usually need to read the geometry files and the material files after this i want to drop down and configure primitive and just uh, author all my kinds in here so for the graphs we're going to set this to be our top level component like so and then the geo is going to be an empty right now you see it's an x form we don't need it to be an X form because the component is already an X form, so we can just set this to a scope. And then after I hit this, I'm going to drop copy this configure layer and call this payload. And I'm just going to drop this into a payload block, like so. Again, multi input slash grass. And you can see that we now have this orange up here, and that's the loaded payload. If you want to see this color key, you can just Click this legend up here. I'm going to launch all the payload info and I can just pipe this into a USD ROM now. And if I go ahead and before I do that, I want to be on soft create and under import data, I can just set author time samples to another since this is our static geometry, remember? So we have that and I'll set this as grass.usda. So now those files are written out and if I reference this in, you should be able to see it here. Perfect, it's got the material and it's no animation. So now we're going to work on creating the animation. For this, I'm going to drop down a soft import. There's a couple ways you can do this. You can also use a soft modify, which you could pipe in after this and unpack it and then edit the polygons in here, which will be rewritten out to USD. But you notice you've got the exact same menu that you do on the soft import and soft create here. So I just specified now the animation node in here, and I'm just going to reference that here, like so. Um, animation, and you can see here we've got a little bit of wind animation um, just in those first frames. And I'm going to set this to slash grass geo, but this doesn't really matter since we'll usually be referencing this in, but we can just specify that later. So we definitely want time samples here. And so there's a couple important things. This is where I made a mistake before. We want us to be actually set topology attributes and none because we're writing out the topology in a static match. So we don't need topology here. You notice that makes it disappear. That's fine, because remember, again, topology is written out in the static and we're going to be referencing this over that. The attribute specifies the attributes we want to save. So we've got position, which is um, changing. And we're since we're changing position, we also need to have three calculated normals. And the UV though, we can keep the same. So now this looks good. I'm just going to drop down a I can also set kind authoring, just none. I can actually set 
All right, so now if I drop down a USB rock here, you can go ahead and say specific frame range. I'll just render frame 80 or 40 is fine. And then if I say this under frames or fx.usda, I'll just go ahead and save this out and go ahead and once this is done, I'll be back. All right, so it's finished and we've just got an issue that it generated an automatic stage right here. And the reason is that is because we didn't set copy contents into editable layer here. So now once that's set, it won't need to save out a separate file. And if I go ahead and reference or open up that USDA file so we can look at what's in here, we can see that we've got our normals time sample, our 40 frames up here, and then our position time samples will also be down here, but that's all that's in this file. Now, if I was to go ahead and go up here and turn topology to static and re-render this out, we're going to see something slightly different. So again, open this up. Like so. You can see we've got face vertex count and face vertex indices. So that's our polygon geometry. But again, we don't need that. And you can also see that in our that shows up again. So I'm going to go ahead and set this back. None. Save this out. And there's another way to set up animations if you are looking to, if you have a really big mesh, for example, um, or uh, sorry, a heavy simulation. So you want to save up every frame separately, sort of like we do caching. You just want to turn on flush data after each frame. And I can go ahead and save this out. And if I go ahead and open up these files now, You'll see it's a lot smaller because it's only one frame. You can see the time code is only one. It's only got one time sample. But again, we've got the same attributes for the normals and the position, which is down in the bottom of the file. So if we want to read in this, we have to create a raw net and use a USD stitch clips raw for this. So we're going to just specify our input file. So that's right here, underscore dollar F. We want to specify our output file. So this will all just fall back stitch by USDA, our primitive path will be right here and our name, clip name will just call it default. This was only to frame 40. So I'll go ahead and render this. And now let's go ahead and take a look at these USD files that I created. So it creates a stitch manifest topology and then just the plain stitch files. So if I read these in, you can see that the manifest, it just create, it just got this normals and points. And you'll notice those are the same as the time stable attributes. So if we go back here to the USD description, it will say that the manifest is an individual layer that there's attributes for that time samples. And you don't need to look much more into it than that. The topology, we don't have um, any topology due to set topology to none. So we don't see any values stored in here. And the stitch is where we can see we're referencing in our frames here and our manifest and our. Uh, Topology as well as our trim path. And then, so we've got a couple values here. So we've got active, we've got the times value. And if you look at the documentation, like so, we've got active clips and it says entries in the active metadata determine when a particular clip's active. And it's got a stage time and asset index. So right here, we're looking at stage time. So stage time when it starts at one, we're looking at asset index zero. So that's where we're seeing this down here. Since the list started at index of zero, we're saying at frame one. We're at time, stage time one, get fx1 at stage time two, get the first index, which is fx2, and so forth. And we've got times right here. What that shows is stage time clip time. So you'll notice here we have at stage time of one, the clip time is one, and so forth. So that makes sense, it's one to one. So some use cases for that, it specifies here, it says times and metadata can be used to offset and scale animation from clips. And if you want to look at uh, looping, you can take a look at the example on the US uh, Pixar's documentation site. So for example, here, um, when an attribute at uh, the stage time zero is requested, it's going to retrieve the clip time of five. So whereas we were doing just one to one, this is not that difference. So now that that's done, just to make sure our animation is working, if we go ahead and reference, so this is our static. Let's go ahead and reference, and let's try both of our animations. So we've got the effects, the CA, and we want to make sure this is set to reference under here. So or under here, or just under slash grass, since we've set 
hierarchy properly. So you can see that there's our animation. And then for the uh, stitch, we should have the same thing. And again, you see the exact same thing here. So that's all looking perfect. And I'm gonna go ahead and go over instancing now. So I'm going to create a loft net, and we're just gonna go over random instancing. I'm going to create an instancer and copy in my references really quick, like so. And I'm going to input my static instance, create a grid in here. Just do a quick instancing setup. So I'm gonna drop down a scatter node, unpin my viewport quickly, and increase my scatter points to maybe 10,000 and increase my grid size to something like 30 and 30. I'm just going to drop down an attribute randomize and I'm going to use this to orient them randomly. This is a quaternion, so it's got four dimensions. These first values I'll set on the min. So this is the rotational vector, so zero. So we've got one on the y, so it's rotating on the y. This fourth is the rotation amount in radians, so we're random radians between zero and one. I'm going to drop down an attribute noise for the p scale. So I can set this to make this, uh, I want to post-process this so that the minimum scale is not zero, but 0.5. We don't want any of that to be invisible. This is fine being a float. And we can set the element size to something a little bit bigger. Not much bigger like that, that's fine. All right, so that looks good. And then after this, I am good to go. So I can go out here. You see all of our grass has been instanced now. But it's being cold, strangely. Something weird is going on there. Okay, there we go. Just had to kick the viewport. Sometimes you have to do that. And kick the materials again. So after this, if I wanted to, I could reference in my animation. I just want to make sure I'm referencing it to the proper place. So like this, and we should see our animation now. So there we've got our animation, and you see the material disappeared, but actually if we go into the farming viewport, you see they're still there, it's just a viewport error. And, but the problem is they're all the same, so that looks horrible. So what we wanna do is drop down a retime instances. But before we do this, we actually need to create a cache. So we're just going to cache all the frames. So before this, I'm just gonna set this down to 40. Click apply because our animation is only 40 frames long. I'll go ahead and cache this. I'll just say cache. Always cache all frames. So this is going to cache 40 frames. And allow us to retime the instances. So for here we need to grab the instancer. And we want to specify all instances. If you want to read more about this, just hover over here. I'm going to retime using random values. And then the variations will say we have three variations. And now if we go ahead and play this, we should see that these are starting at different, if you focus on this one right here, you can see it hasn't started yet, and then it starts now. So there we can see we've got our variation there. And now I'm going to go over creating that Ivy Grove that I showed earlier. For this, I'm not going to create the setup from scratch since it might take a little long and be time consuming, but basically what I've got going on here is I'm using the Ivy or the Vine tool that I've created in my last video and you can just download that for free and i've just got a quick um, setup here like so and i've just output the curves and then i'm going to the stage again i've got a setup where i'm just importing my base geometry and i actually yeah I'm with mine's in here and then i've got my animated flower right here so you can see like so i've got the flower and i've got the effects referenced into it it's just a simple bend animation that's, uh, I believe, one or two seconds long. So if I go into flowers, you can see in here I'm importing my vine curves. So, and I'm time shifting it for the last frame. In my case, that would be 160 frames. I'm setting, I just got, uh, I'm removing all my endpoints, and that's just because uh, in the technique, you'll see why I had to do that later on. I'm setting a density value equal to the Y position, and I'm just remapping that with a ramp in here. And if I color to visualize that, you see I have low densities at the bottom, and that's just so I can scatter the points and get less points at the bottom. So now I've got these points on here, I want to specify when they start to grow. And for that, I'm resampling my curves right here, and I'm polywiring, and I'm using that to create a V2V from polygons. So I'm gonna use this inside of a solver, 
um, which is a, this is a bit of a weird setup. I'm not sure if there's a better way to do this, but I'm curious if there is. So I'm bringing in that BDB on the left side and my points, I'm grouping it by frame. So you can see as it goes up, they're being grouped. And when these are grouped, so the group I created is called in, and this acts on grouped in, it's creating um, an integer value called in with a value of one. And then I say, if that value is equal to one, and if the frame is equal to zero, the frame is equal to the frame. And if it's not equal to zero, the frame is equal to um, this value. So I probably could have named these attributes better. So basically what I'm saying here is you'll notice this has an uppercase F. So that's the global variable. So this right here, whereas at frame is a value I'm creating. Um, by myself. So basically what this does is it just when this point is grouped, it gets the attribute of n. So it's looking if n is equal to one, which for example, um, this point is right here, it's going to say if the frame is equal to zero, which it's not. So it's just going to say if the frame is not equal to zero, which it is, at frame is equal to the frame that it came in. And if we go out and look out on the solver and see what result this gives us, we should see, you can see the frames are writing in right here, like so. So after that, I'm just time shifting into the last frame because we don't need to be animated and I'm just sashing this. So it's cooked, essentially. And then after this, I've just got my cache. Like before, we need the cache to retime instances. So I'm just going to cache all the frames. Which takes a little bit while I wait, and then just drop down a normal uh, retime instances, like so. And inside here, we got the same setup, but this time, retime instances is set to internal soft. So let me just drop down a retime instances to see the default all default values are. So you set this to internal soft. All this is left the same. I set my attribute to frame, which is remember the attribute I had the solver. So then here you can see I'm bringing in those points that I had created in the solver, and then I'm copying the attribute. So this is, you want to use an attribute copy instead of an attribute transfer, since we have the exact same, these are the exact same points that we scattered on. So they have the same point IDs and we're transferring the frame. And I'm just saying the F at frame is equal to the at frame times negative one, because we want to set the start to be backwards. So. If you were to just have the frame value, the start point has an attribute value of, let's say, 17. That animation is going to start at frame 17 instead of frame 0. What we want to happen is, or it's going to start 17 frames earlier, so it's actually going to start all the way back here. But we want to have it negative, so it's actually starting uh, frame 17 up here. And then I'm just offsetting it by 20. Um, just in terms of speed, I had some issues. So that gives us the end result. And that's one way how you can do this. So hope this was helpful.